What is a conductor and what do they do? That's a very, that's the question. Um, I would say there are probably two very important aspects uh, of what a conductor is doing. Um, the first part is probably uh, the most evident, so what everybody can see from the outside, but this is also by far the less interesting part of conducting, uh, which is the conductor shapes how a piece should be played. Um, for example, the conductor decides, of course, the tempo of a performance. Uh, he can shape in a particular way the dynamics, the piano, how, or how far, the, or also the, the connections, how you want to go from one point of the composition to the next one. Um, of course, the conductor has also a control uh, about uh, the articulation of the piece, underlines or even deciding um, how notes have to be played. But the really important thing is not how, but it is why. And this is, in my opinion, the real work of a conductor. Um, the conductor shapes this why, not because uh, he speaks for hours to the orchestra about uh, why one should play a passage like this or like that. This why happens in a very subliminal way. Everybody, every person on earth, even without being a musician, listens or has a kind of listening to himself, which shapes his or her presence. So I'm not speaking about uh, the listening with our ears. I'm speaking of, of, of the perception of ourself. Um, how we listen or we don't listen to ourself determines how we listen or don't listen to the other ones. Might be this other one, the composition, or our music partners, or even an orchestra. The mirror, so the, the way in which the conductor listens to himself and therefore to the score and therefore to the musicians in front of him or her um, is the mirror for the listening of each musician of the orchestra towards the composition. And this specific quality of listening, which is different for each person on earth shapes the why we are playing the piece. How this happens? I would say that uh, the first important thing is that the listening shapes the time, our time perception. And of course, music happens in time, so this is particularly important. And I can just make a few examples. Um, I would say that we can think of a ritual, of a metaphysical temporality. This is the kind of temporality which we can um, feel, for example, uh, if, we are, if we believe when we enter in a church or maybe in front of some great work of art or simply when we fall in love and time seems stop. But at the same time, this suspended time has an incredible transforming power on us. So there are conductors which can shape this kind of metaphysical time. I think, for example, one of the greatest conductors of any time, I think, Furt Wengler. And uh, you can feel that each note that he plays is, is sacred, and it sounds sacred, uh, not because the music is, is sacred or is speaking about God, but because each note 
he plays alludes to a higher dimension which embraces us all. And there are really a few musicians who have this magic. And it's interesting to know that uh, this kind of temporality implies a very specific quality of listening. Because, I mean, everybody would, be, would agree that to, to listen is better than not to listen making music. But the real question is that uh, there are many different ways of listening. So the real question is, how am I listening to this? And because this makes my poetic. And in the case of, uh, of Furtwängler, I think that the key word of the communication is empathy. In the moment that you feel this sacred feeling and that uh, the presence of a higher dimension, your desire, your burning desire, will somehow bring all musicians in a magical, empathic way to feel and will the same. Um, so in, in, in this case, I think that the orchestra becomes, every person in the orchestra becomes like a part of a living organism, which uh, needs and wants the same thing. But this is not only kind of temporality which we can create. For example, the opposite kind of temporality to the metaphysical one would be the everyday time. So the, the, not the sacred temporality, but uh, the, the, the temporality which is connected to our everyday life. And even starting from a real listening of this kind of temporality, we can make great interpretations of music. Uh, one of my favorite conductors, together with Futwängler, is uh, Nicolas Harnoncourt. And I think he, he was one of the greatest conductors of the here and now temporality. Uh, in this case, you don't feel that the time is suspended in his interpretation. You really feel a beat, a pulse of a human heart. Once again, the key word is not empathy anymore, but human, I would say. And uh, being here together in, in a real life time, temporality also implies a different relationship with the musicians, which is not anymore empathic, but I would say is more democratic in this case. Um, in this case, the conductor is a kind of um, primus inter pares, which means, uh, of course, he leads the interpretation, so there, it's not uh, anarchy. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, he's, he achieves the goal of the interpretation while every person in the orchestra puts their own feelings and motivation, personal feelings and motivations, in, in the ingredients which make the cake. <laughs> um, and this is a completely uh, different approach. Uh, then there is another way, uh, for example, there are many more, but a, a last kind of temporality could be a temporality which is very common in contemporary music. For my personal opinion, I would say unfortunately, but this is in any case, very present, um, which is the structuralistic approach. Uh, the structuralism um, comes right after the tragedy of the World War II. And I think their main concern was after the horrible things which just happened, we fear somehow the pathos which comes from, from that metaphysical listening of the Furtwängler generation. So is it possible to find, to build an art, a work on, uh, of, of art and interpretations in music, which are not connected to something which is connected to mystery, which can eventually lead to catastrophe, but can we do something which, which, which we can control? No? Le Corbusier, the architect, said, uh, um, 
a home, a house is, is, a, is a machine to live in. So the idea that uh, you can build a work of art, so a, a house is not uh, a foyer, a symbolic place anymore, where you can eventually feel the warmness of your family and protected from the dangers of outside, but it's, it is a machine. And in, in this sense, I think that uh, Boulez, who is probably the most important structuralist conductor and composer that we have, um, uh, was saying we have to colonize time by calculating. So it's very interesting. So this need, time is not anymore an experience like it would be in the case, both in the case of, of Harnoncourt and Furtwängler, uh, but is, it is an object. Or something to be controlled or to be, or to be dominated. Exactly. Uh, to, be, to be counted, to be parceled out and to be measured. Yeah. Um, well, since you're talking about different approaches to conductors, I think this is extremely interesting. I mean, it, it, it reveals that there's not one way to conduct. I mean, that's perhaps a statement of the obvious, but there are extraordinarily different approaches that can be taken. And that's something that I've noticed on many occasions myself when attending concerts. So to give one example, I heard a performance by Daniel Gatti in Paris at the Salle Playel, back in the time when the Salle Playel still gave concerts of, of classical music. I think it was the, uh, the Schubert Fifth Symphony. And I was struck by the fact that when he started, of course, he gave a downbeat. And then his arms just went like this. And then he's just standing there. And you would occasionally sort of give a little look or something or give a gesture, but he wasn't providing a beat for the musicians. And I would contrast that with someone like Leonard Bernstein, for example, who he, he's constantly moving. He's dancing. He's, he's hysterically gesticulating. He's sweating like a maniac. And uh, he never stops, you know. So what's going on there? How is it possible to have two such extraordinarily different approaches to conducting? I think that it's useful to uh, remind or to understand that uh, indeed there are in the end... Uh, um, together with the different kind of temporalities that you can create as a conductor, but there are two main ways of understanding conducting. And you named, I think, two very good examples for each way. Uh, Hermann Scherchen, who has been a great conductor and who wrote one of the most famous conducting books, which has been written until today about the technique of conducting, uh, he says that uh, a real conductor with a great, well-prepared orchestra actually does not need rehearsals because a real conductor, in his opinion, can shape every detail of, of his interpretation with his hands and baton. So if the orchestra can absolutely play the piece, no rehearsals before are needed. But in this case, of course, you need to provide the information for each note. So in this case, the conductor will be indeed very active because uh, you have to tell the orchestra how they have to play each phrase. Uh, in, I would say that this kind of conductor, so described by, by Scherchen and Bernstein is... Uh, an example of, of this attitude, uh, in a way considers the orchestra like a pianist considers the piano, which is an instrument. So I think the idea, is, of course, if, if a pianist stops playing a concert, the piano does not play by itself. And, uh, and so happens for this kind of conductor. So um, in a way, the orchestra is a passive mass and uh, it just answers in an analogical way, spontaneous, unconscious way, to the gesture that the conductor is moving in each bar of the piece. But, and this is maybe also the cliche, if you want, of, of the conductor. Now, usually, you know, the, the, the maestro with capital M is moving like that all the time. But indeed, that's not the only way of conducting. Uh, there are other conductors, and the already mentioned Harnon Court could be a very good example of this other way of thinking, the role of a conductor. Harnon Court himself, uh, he said, 
the idea, I quote him almost literally, the idea of a conductor who is playing the orchestra with his hands, I find it disgusting, ekelhaft. Um, I don't know if he had in mind really the book of Scherchen, but it might be possible. <laughs> and, and in this case, the conductor, I think I can do this comparison, is more similar to the to the to the regisseur of of a theatrical piece, so a theater regisseur, a theater director, a theater director, a theater yes, to the theater director, um, because you may you make the the dirty job <laughs> during the rehearsals. So during the rehearsal, it's during the rehearsal in different ways with your gesture or explaining. In any case, that you bring each musician to the consciousness of what he has to do. It's interesting because um, it's not that you read uh, Heidegger to the musicians for 10 hours or that you have to convince them that your feeling towards the, the pieces should be also their feeling. Of course not. In this case, you have a frame, a very even very strong, it's very specific frame of your interpretation. But then you have to be so flexible that uh, every musician, every person in the orchestra will contribute to this interpretation using their own feelings and their own motiva motivation for those feelings. And your work in the rehearsals is to evoke and uh, letting them uh, being able to do this during the concert. But once that you have done this during the rehearsals, in a way, uh, I would say in Italian, we, have, we would say this is the, the role of a maestro concertatore. Also, also Muti, Riccardo Muti speaks about this. But then exactly during the rehearsals, during the concert, you can relax because the musician at the 99%, they already know what they have to do, so what the direction of the interpretation is, and this you, you just can remind with more gesture about the work which you have already done, and then let them just bring that spontaneity uh, of, the, of the live concert, but, but nothing more. You should not disturb them, but uh, just let them listen to each other. So there are that's, I think, the, the reason. So there are really these two different, completely different approaches. So a couple of things there. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the conductor can either approach the orchestra as a kind of passive lump that has to be shaped and formed and played as though the orchestra were an external instrument that the conductor is, is, is the soloist on, effectively. Mm -hmm. And then the other approach would be to view the orchestra as, as a, an ensemble of equal partners, that the the orchestra is playing with you and you're playing with them. And as you say, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a partnership of, of, of what would you say that a, uh, a first among equals, something mm -hmm. like that, exactly. but there, there's a, more of a, a, a chamber music type of approach to work, working with the orchestra. And then the other thing that that implies is that during the concert, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand this when they attend a, a performance, what you're seeing is, is not, the whole story. You're seeing the tip of the iceberg, right? The the, the work has already been done by the musicians. Uh, and you're not witnessing that. You're not witnessing the, the rehearsal process. You're not witnessing any of the, the work that went into it. You're just seeing the result. And the, and the result, you would want to appear effortless, natural, uh, spontaneous, right? You don't, you don't want to necessarily be aware of the effort. And that's something that for me also as a, as a composer is, is very important. And I think we're we're in a, an era also where there's this kind of anxiety around art. There's this idea that by default nobody's going to understand what you what you're doing. So you have to explain everything. And also because we're in this situation where we're surrounded by by social media, and of course I'm contributing to that with this podcast. But there's this idea that the that the artist needs to be uh, both available and not to have any secrets, and everything has to be explained and discussed all the time. And as far as art goes, I think that that's a mistake. I think that there's, uh, there's a certain value to maintaining a certain mystique in the artistic process. I absolutely agree. And I think that uh, an artistic experience is finally like, uh, I really would say it's an erotic experience. So for me, when, when I am in front of 
a painting, for example, or in a concert. I want to feel this kind of erotic experience, which which means what it means erotic, which means that uh, there is a mystery. There is a, I, I I I I fall in love with this mystery in the moment that uh, that everything that the kitchen is explained, and I can just translate ah these things means, and then I have a translation with words about what this would mean. Then it's it's not art. You will, you will not find a person. Who can say, hey, you know, I'm this, 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 this. Do you understand? Yes, I fall in love with you. Mm, probably not. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, okay. So that that allows me to 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 come on to my next question, which is, what fundamentally does a great conductor do that is distinct from an average one or or, or a bad one, in your view? I mean, I'm sure there's many ways to be a great conductor, of course. Maybe the answer is <laughs> I'm answering for you. Maybe the answer is that there are many ways to be. A great conductor, and there's only one way to be a bad one. <laughs> what do you think? No, but uh, thinking about Dante's Inferno, I think that the sins are very much and very different. <laughs> so there are so many ways of being bad. Although, although seriously, I, I, I see the point of, of what you are saying. Um, no, I, I think that uh, um, for me the. I love very much what a sentence of of Kurtag. Uh, I, I I saw him saying this many 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 times. Kurtag, who is one who is not a conductor, but is one of the greatest composer and musicians of our time, and he says, uh, "My biggest enemy in playing music is when you are playing the next note." And something after the first note did and, and, and something did not happen in your soul. So the thing is that uh, you are allowed to go on playing only in the moment that what you are playing is transforming you for real. So this is actually the mark of, of a real listening, of a the, the, the mark that you are offering to the music and to yourself a real listening presence. Okay, so let, let's talk about that for a sec. So I, I, I'm completely with you there, and I'm, I'm with Kurtag, certainly. The problem is that making music, uh, making uh, a performance, is, of course, that. There's a transcendent dimension to it, but it's also a job. It's both things simultaneously. So for performers, for example, if you're the third trombonist in, a, in an orchestra, then you're not necessarily, and this is a caricature, obviously, but you're not necessarily always thinking about transcendence. You're also thinking about doing a doing a good job. You're thinking about intonation. You're thinking about not missing your entrance. About playing properly with the other members of your section. Uh, there's a there's a there's an artisanal side to it as well as an artistic side, and there's there's a kind of pragmatic side as well. So I think it's very easy, particularly in. Uh, the high pressure environment and the very expensive environment of of the way orchestras and ensembles function today, because everything is so expensive, because time is always limited, there's this sense in which okay, we have to get on with things and and we have to you know we have, we have to make this ex, this experience happen. It has to be in tune. It has to be together. And you you start you, you tend to get focused on just these very basic low level dimensions. Let's say the the, the most basic aspect of you know, are we making mistakes? Are we able to get through this passage? <clears throat> are we getting lost? Is it together rhythmically and so on? And there, in, in my experience, very often, particularly with the first performance of something, when, when the ensemble or the orchestra doesn't necessarily know the piece all that well, that's the primary, that seems to be the primary concern. So how do you take a situation like that? You know, because it's like, if, if, you're, if you're terrified of just being able to get through the, the passage, uh, without making a hundred mistakes, how does transcendence come into that? I think that you named precisely what I think is the biggest mistake, but it's also unexcusable. And I think, really, I do believe that uh, the practical situation of the concerts today, where of course you don't have three weeks, as you are already happy if you have two hours to rehearse. Uh, a symphony which is of 45 minutes. Uh, but this cannot be an excuse not to work 
on the artistic part because the the mistake the mistake of the attitude which you named which is unfortunately the common the most common attitude in the musical working process is that okay there is first an a practical uh part of the work which is more connected to the hand work so to speak and then if we have time when we have time we can speak about great art but without the first you cannot make the second mm. this is absolutely wrong even in teaching there are many teachers who teach instrument or conducting like that the thing is that if you play c major for hours 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 on your instrument and only when you have played c major very fast without making mistakes you go to a mozart sonata or a beethoven sonata the fact is that when you find c major in mozart that's not what you have learned because that is Mo mozartian c major and when you find again c major in beethoven that's not what you have learned because that's a beethovian c major and even in kurtag there are c majors case and that's also not what you have practiced uh, so you have practiced something which does not exist and not only what you have practiced is useless but it's also a problem a damage because uh, in order to be able to play a really Mozartian C major, you have to, uh, because the body has a memory, don't you? Will, you will play automatically uh, the C major which you have uh, in your hands, which is not the Mozartian C major. So you have to forget what you have learned to, to, and restart again. I think that's a very important point, actually. And it, it reminds me of something that is in the Schoenberg Harmonielehrer, which is he, he's talking about the sorts of exercises that composers have to do when they're learning how to connect chords together and how to combine multiple lines in a, contra, in a contrapuntal texture. And one of the things he says is that it should never be a matter of dry exercises where you say to the student, okay, here's how you move from a one chord to a six chord and so on. It always, even in the simplest exercise, there has to be a degree of expression involved. You have to be actually making a piece of music, even if it's just one bar of music, even if it's just three chords, there has to be an element of expression in it. So I think what you're suggesting is that this idea of separating, let's say, the artisanal side and the expression side is extremely dangerous. Is it? Yes, it's extremely dangerous because uh, someone who knows how to do things and only works on how, maybe he will not find the reason to do it during all his life. Instead, someone who knows why we are doing something, from this why we can certainly find our how. And the, the, the same working with, the, with an orchestra. Of course, you have to take care that this is staccato, this is legato, uh, this might be a little bit more crescendo, but very often you just have the conductor telling, yes, a little bit more staccato, a little bit more this, and like, like that. And then you get a useless staccato, a useless legato, a useless crescendo, which in the end sounds boring well there's no motivation or meaning behind exactly. it exactly and so the real work of a conductor i'm not saying at all that uh, uh, the artisanal part uh, is not important or less important it is important but you 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 will get this kind of intonation this kind of color of sound this kind of staccato starting from an emotional reason to do it so when you are angry say no I'm not thinking about my movements. I just say no, and and, as, and uh, this is the starting point, actually. So to 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 get back to a real experience, which lets us make that kind of sound, and not simply saying you yeah, because in the moment that uh, that you do something like, like a staccato, legato, whatever you want, and you are thinking consciously of it, you are killing it because it's not natural anymore, but it is artificial. And there's no way to do it better afterwards. Okay, so we were talking earlier about the, the difference between 
let's say, a conductor who imagines the orchestra as, as a lump of clay that they are working with, that, that they are playing effectively, versus the, the more chamber uh, uh, egalitarian approach, let's say. <laughs> so this makes me wonder, actually, <laughs> now I've, I've been in situations where there's been an excellent ensemble and a conductor, uh, not so, you know, and then I've, I've been in situations where there's uh, a fantastic a conductor and the ensemble maybe is, is less experienced or is maybe not uh, as comfortable, let's say, with the repertory. So to put a bit of a caricature on it, what would be the, the least objectionable situation? A bad conductor with an excellent orchestra or a bad orchestra with an excellent conductor? <laughs> I don't ask you uh, in what in which case I, I i answer with my ensemble but right. uh, <laughs> we will discuss it later uh, but in any case what i can say um no of of course there are uh cases where the orchestra is so good that still it can almost ignore the the fact that the conductor is meaningless or disturbing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, if you have an orchestra which is open with its heart, that, 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 that's the, the real quality which is necessary. Because of course then there are different ways of being good or, or, or average, let's say. But uh, I, I guess you were speaking about the instrumental quality of the of the musical ensemble and i would say that the 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 main quality is the really the openness of the heart of the musicians which means how ready they are to to take the danger of of something which they cannot control or which they don't know if they are ready to to follow the conductor in into the mystery then this orchestra will probably sound regardless of how they master the instruments better than any other orchestra if the conductor is inspired and can bring his musicians to in a good way and through an interesting musical journey. Um, so I would say that, uh, uh, once again, uh, it's the same reason why you don't need to study piano 20 years to play very, 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 very good. Because, uh, this is again Kurtag uh, who teaches this, it's not me, uh, you should be able to teach even someone who is playing piano the first time, so to his first music lesson, to play, of course, in this case, maybe it will be one note, but playing good is not a matter about how many notes you play. You can maybe play one single note or maybe three notes and try to play good as, as Richter or as Horowitz. Uh, this, is, and this is possible. This is always possible, regardless where you are now technically. Uh, with, with your instrument, so so certainly, but but you need musicians who are ready and willing to do this. So in my experience, once again, the the it, it happened to me. Uh, so I I'm always more or less the the same level. So trying to grow every day, but uh, it's always me, and it happened to me even in the same month to conduct orchestras of different levels. But not necessarily the the orchestra which was uh, instrumentally better was playing better because maybe they were more closed and less open to to the idea of uh, so psychologically to follow and then it sounds worse. Right. Well, let, let me relate this again to something that has actually happened to me about fifteen years ago. So going back quite a ways. I had a performance of a piece of mine that was, it was a bad performance. I mean, anyone would have agreed it was, it was not good. Um, and I was, you know, disappointed about this, obviously. And 
there was a much older and more experienced composer who was there at the rehearsal and at the concert. And he said, you know, your piece still sounded good. He said, a bad piece, uh, uh, sorry, he said, a, a good piece can survive a bad performance. And that was obviously very encouraging. It gave me some hope also that that maybe, you know, some trace of what I had attempted to produce was still evident in that. But I wonder if um, if the reverse is true, you know, can is it possible to take a bad piece and perform it so sublimely that an extraordinary musical experience emerges out of that? There's there's a there's a quote actually by the Swiss oboist conductor and composer Heinz Holliger. Uh, he talks about the fact that during his career as an oboist, I mean, the oboe repertory is not enormous, right? There, there's a very limited number of pieces. And so in order to have more things to play, he went and did a lot of research and found old pieces that were sitting in libraries that nobody was performing. And he found a lot of average sort of classical Baroque uh, romantic pieces for oboe English horn that, that nobody was playing. And in some instances, those pieces were actually quite bad, but he played them anyway. And he made the observation that, you know, so it doesn't necessarily always matter if the piece is bad. Uh, if you can play it really convincingly, and m sometimes quite bad music may have something else that's interesting about it. So, for example, it might be interesting from a technical perspective or an instrumental perspective, or it might it might push the limits of an instrument. So, um, so anyway, those, those are a couple of things that, that I've often wondered about. Because I think one of the things that an audience coming to a, a performance of a new piece one thing that is very challenging for that audience is if they don't have a good time, there's no way for them to know if it's because the piece is bad, the performance is bad, the conductor is bad, all three, maybe, or maybe all three are excellent, but they can't tell because they can't really judge it. So that that's a <laughs> that's a, a whole lot of uh, related or, or or slightly related thoughts. What would you say? I would say I start from the first part, uh, and I think I'm. I unfortunately I don't agree that uh, a good piece of music always um, survives a bad performance, and I really also don't think it is connected. Um, it has to do with with the quality, with the intrinsic quality um, of the of, of the of the composition, but it depends from from other parameters, which are difficult to describe. But for example, uh, I think indeed that uh, Bach can quite survive uh, a bad performance. Uh, Mozart, and I would, would not say that Mozart is less good than Bach, <laughs> uh, but Mozart, in my opinion, cannot survive a bad performance. So uh, probably in pieces where the structure is more evident and the structure is more connected to the to the beauty of the music then of course even with a bad performance you cannot destroy the structure too much if you just are playing more or less the notes <laughs> uh, but uh, when for example the music is more connected to the to the state of grace <laughs> of illumination like in the case of mozart uh, that the phrase and expression and then, of course, even if the music would imply this, but you are not doing it, then it does not sound, and then then it sounds boring or, or bad. That's the first part, maybe, of my answer. Um, but I do agree with Holliger and with you uh, that uh, also maybe a so-so piece can be an interesting experience because, of course, there are always, once again, there are always two aspects. There is what you offer to the public and how. And of course, you can read Shakespeare or Dante. And in this case, even if I read it, I'm, I'm not a poet, so I read, would read it bad. <laughs> uh, but still, I'm reading Dante or Shakespeare. So at least if you concentrate on what is written, that it's fantastic. Uh, but if you take a great actor, then even if he says five words, he, then the public will feel not what, this in, not interesting five words, but how, so his presence. My teacher used to say, you have to play C major and uh, let people, and be able to let people 
laugh or cry. And this, I think, rejoins what you, you, are, you are telling. In this case, in the, in the case of, of a mediocre or average composition, the music becomes like a pretext, sorry, an occasion to show or to share with the public your own values. Mm. And of course, if you are a great person, but I mean, this you can tell of very few, but I can understand that if Horowitz plays, he, as Horowitz, is such a deep person and uh, has uh, an incredible horizon of values, then that you just hear him and it's fantastic. But then, okay, in this case, you, you have to be, let's say, as a performer, such a great person as Schumann or as Schubert. And this can happen, but of course, it does not happen exactly every day. But, and once again, this brings me very, very shortly, because what is an interpretation? No, I think that interpretation is an encounter. And it's a kind of, of, of garden and uh, the composer and the performer are 50-50 in this garden. So I think that um, the, and the two possible mistakes for a performer are to not to listen to the composer, so to, to the other one. And everybody in, 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 I think, has done the experience of someone who speaks, speaks, a friend or, or someone, someone and who does not listen. No, so so there are persons like that, and there are also musicians who do not listen the other one, mm -hmm. so not even the composer. So they project their own values and their own poetic and aesthetic on the other one, so on the composer. So they play themselves all the time. So regardless of what they are playing, everything sounds the same. There is, there is then the opposite mistake. So to 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 live in the illusion that you know that, you, that we would be able to disappear completely and uh, that now only Beethoven will be heard and not myself. But in truth, you only let speak your projection or what you believe that Beethoven was, which is, of course, uh, a, a distortion. No? I think the most honest approach is really to say we are here once again. We share 50-50 this space and we have to, like in, in a love story, to create something which is not me, not you, but is an interpretation which has something like a child of both of us, but it, which is neither of us at the same time. I think this is something that, this, like, this is definitely advice that I would, I would give to any composer is be very careful who you work with because the performer is the public face of your work and it's all the audience hears. It's very, very, very important. And there's a kind of sense in which, because composers like to get performances, they like their music to be played and there's obvious reasons for that. But a bad performance can do so much damage. Yes. And especially if there's only one recording, especially if there's only one performance, that's all anybody knows about that piece. And that recording can exist for decades. Who knows how long? And it can, you know, if, if the recording is published, then there will be copies of it for uh, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And that will be what people hear about that piece. Yes. And there are many compositions that I know from the 20th century for which there's only one recording. Mm -hmm. And if it's a bad recording, you know, people aren't necessarily going to know that. So it's, it's important to be extremely careful who you choose and to work with. Uh, and... I think that the, the era in which it was possible to be maybe a little bit more casual about that because there was maybe always the promise of a future performance or because not everything was necessarily recorded, I think that's over. Absolutely, yes. And the fact that we, we, we have such permanent presence of recordings or performances of bad recording, as you say, uh, I would say maybe even more than bad because they can be correct somehow, but they are useless because uh, they do not share the necessity uh, of that recording or, or, or the necessity of the existence of that piece in that moment, in that society. And that is what is often miss, missing in the interpretations. And this is, I think, 
the reason why a lot of people do not care anymore about modern art in general, not only modern music, because uh, maybe one time they, they listen to something and they say, it's boring. And the problem is that they are right because it is boring. Mm -hmm. Maybe not because the composition is bad, but because the way it is played does not represent the voice or the need of some people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely disconnected. So the work of the performer, well, not of the composer too, but it's completely disconnected from the voice of the community. What I mean is, we'll just make an example. Furt Wengler, each note of Furt Wengler, regardless of the fact that you like his interpretation or, or not, but in any case, it is clear that uh, all persons listen to him in his time could recognize themselves. So could see that Furt Wengler was representing a dream an idealistic dream of what they wanted to be as a society. And if you are not able to reconstruct this as a, as a performer, then you are killing the piece. And as you say, you, everybody or almost everybody who will listen to, to that piece will say, but it does not concern me with reasons. And uh, so that's have to be stopped somehow, I think. Well, the damage can be extraordinarily long-lasting. So uh, let me give you an example. So Robert Kraft recorded the complete Webern works twice. Uh, there was a, a, a set of LPs that came out in, uh, it was a long time ago, probably the 1960s. And then he recorded the entire set a second time for Naxos on CD. And the second set is outstanding, by the way. It's, it's a very, very good set. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful performances of the pieces. In some instances, they're the, they're the finest recordings you can get of those works. The first set is quite bad. It's not necessarily Robert Kraft's fault. The pieces were unknown. The performers had an extraordinarily difficult time technically playing them. Um, and I think it wasn't necessarily obvious in the 1950s and 1960s how one should go about interpreting this music. The problem is, though, the first set is the one that everybody heard. And so those performances where it's, very, first of all, it, technically they're very bad, they're out of tune, they're not together, so that's one thing. But there's also this sense in which the performers are struggling to understand what they're playing and not really quite grasping it. You know, there's a, there's a disconnect, I think, between the the desire for expression in the in the compositions and then what the performers are, are able to do with them. And uh, that really did affect Webern's reputation in a negative way for a very long time. And it wasn't just the Robert Kraft recordings. It was the early Boulez performances. It was lots of things like this. There were a few people who knew how to play that music, but 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 very few people did. So obviously by that point, Webern was dead. So there was nothing he could do. He couldn't intervene personally. But I just say that as a, as a uh, perhaps a warning to composers that you must take this seriously. Uh, there have been artists who have taken it extremely seriously and who have understood basically that if they want the work to be presented optimally in a manner that is likely to, or, or relatively likely, let's say, to, uh, to connect with people, then in a sense, you must be responsible for the entire chain of production, okay. from the conception of the work to its composition, to finding the ideal partners to work with, the recording process, the distribution, everything. And you might say that's extreme, but well, look at Wagner. That's basically what Wagner did. And he was right to do that. Yes. Look at what Stockhausen did. Stockhausen in the, I think, 1970s created the Stockhausen Verlag, mm -hmm. uh, in which he stopped working with Universal Edition. He published all his own works himself. He oversaw the engraving down to the tiniest details. Mm -hmm. He, in fact, you know, he had a music copyist who lived in his house with him for 25 years, just down the, down the hallway from where he was doing his composing. And I met this guy, actually, and he said, yeah, no, he was very, very involved. He would say, no, that's not the right shape of note head, or that's not the way that this page should be laid out. He was very, you know, precise about things like that. And he oversaw all of his productions with minute detail. A lot of people say, oh, Stockhausen, what a, what a megalomaniac, what a, you know. But I say, you know, bravo, Karl Heinz, that was, that was a good thing to have done. Who else would have done it, you know? And you could say, well... Maybe it's better to 
be a little bit more casual with things. But again, I, I don't really agree. Another example is someone like Philip Glass or Steve Reich. And, you know, they created not only their own audience, but they created the conditions for their work to be disseminated mm -hmm. from scratch. And you can say, you know, whatever. There's lots of people who say that Philip Glass is, is a more of a commercial composer or that the work isn't uh, necessarily always of the highest standard. But you have to admire that. Yes. You have to admire that. And I find that infinitely more admirable than the attitude of a university composer who writes his pieces, sits back, allows the university ensemble to play them for 20 people, and then nobody hears it. Yes. That's not admirable. Yes. I, I do agree. I deeply agree. And I also admire you for very much for telling this and trying to do this. Um, but what I can add is that, uh, once again, uh, a composer who is not consistent um, and who do not, do not care about the quality of the performances is not only killing uh, his or her own music, which is already quite bad, of course, but, uh, but even more, he, they are killing the category of to the, the genre of, of contemporary music, because uh, it might be that uh, I, I hear one contemporary piece in my life, and then I associate that bad experience to the whole genre. So, okay, I've listened to this piece in a bad performance. I don't know which is a bad performance, but I just say, okay, it does not speak to me. I feel it's useless and boring uh, because of bad interpretation. And then I will never hear, listen any anymore in my life to this kind of music. And so I am, if, 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 if as a composer or as a, or as a performer, you, you contribute to this attitude. So to make many recordings or many concerts, which are actually maybe correct, but useless from a spiritual point of view, you are actually actively um, making a contribution to let everything die. Because already now, uh, I've, it's not a mystery, you know, I think that uh, the, the most of contemporary music is still is alive uh, under artificial conditions. Uh, I would say this, because, uh, because there is uh, money, but the paradox is that there is money from a society which is not actually interested in it. So, and then you get this money, um, asking, you know, certainly much better than me, but you have to make a project. And this project, and this is also another catastrophe of our time, because your, your project has to be interesting. And of course, in your project, you cannot write, uh, uh, I write better music, or I am more transcendental, or I offer a more symbolic and authentic ex experience. Uh, so, and, and so what is the m misunderstanding which always happens? Usually it is interesting, and it is artist. It is considered uh, uh, interesting or artistic if it is done for the first time. So, in the moment that you cannot speak about transcendence anymore, then the parameter of quality is how new it is. So, I am the first one who writes a piece. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, um, and I'm doing a tattoo on the body of someone, and I write, and this has never done before. Or I am the first one who. Does. I don't know, writes a symphony using one note, or I don't know. But the fact that you are the first one does not exclude that uh, no, no one needs it, or that is something completely stupid or, or useless. I, I'm not sure how important that is in, in the contemporary music world now, simply because there have now been decades upon decades of, uh, what would you say, of composers attempting to push boundaries and there are no boundaries left to push in a certain sense i mean it's not it's not a fruitful direction to work in anymore I, and i think i think it would be it would be very difficult to find people who would overtly say that that's what they're doing and, and would claim that, that there's a there's a, an intrinsic value to that um what i would say is that we have a problem of incentivization in the new music community but it, it's not only there it's something that is a, a broader societal question as well. So for example, if we if we take an, an example from the political sphere, one of the potential weaknesses, I suppose, of uh, a lot of democratic societies in the way that they're set up is that politicians are motivated to get reelected. They're motivated to do things within a four or five year time frame. Mm -hmm. 
And they're concerned about what happens at the end of those four years, if they're going to be able to remain in office or not. So you, you have an, an incentive to think on a very short term. You're mm -hmm. not thinking about, well, what are the consequences of this action 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? You're thinking, am I going to get reelected? And in terms of music, I think there's a bit of a similar issue there, which is that it's easy for composers to think, you know, I, I need to survive, obviously, I need to have income, and I need to have a stream of professional opportunities. So I'm going to do these things that may not be ideal, but at least they'll manage, they'll allow me to, to continue my professional activity. So maybe I don't want to necessarily write this piece, maybe I don't want to work with this ensemble, maybe this orchestra isn't the greatest, but I need to have a stream of commissions, so I'm going to do the project. So we're incentivizing this project by project, short term thinking, yes. and not so much in terms of, you know, when you're 90 years old and you're looking back on what you've created, you know, what, what is your legacy? Yes, and indeed, uh, I think it's uh, every composer, every artist, every performer should not forget that uh, if you, if you in the end you make a bad project, but in the bad in the in, in the sense that it, it is not connected to the real needs of the society which you represent, then you are not only destroying the memory of that single piece, that single composition, but you are contributing actively to destroy the category, so the, the genre, so, so to speak, so the music itself, because uh, there will be a lot of people who will maybe only listen by chance, by coincidence, that piece, that recording, for example, and they will think it's boring, it's useless, with reasons, because it is played in a boring, a useless way, and then they will never again be interested in listening to modern art or contemporary music. Uh, so you have destroyed the possibility for a lot of people to, to, to get a relationship with this, with this music. Uh, so we have a huge responsibility. And once again, I think that this responsibility is not uh, only, of course, in, in terms of, uh, of being correct, precise, and, and, and be accurate. Of course, this is also part of our job. But, uh, but once again, I think that uh, every performance should come from a shared need of that performance. And this is, in my opinion, the problem today. Because uh, when we listen to Furt Wengler, does not matter now if uh, how much we love him or, or not, but there is no doubt that every note he plays was at his time the voice was giving voice to the entire community which was sitting in the public and listening to him. So the community could certainly identify itself in that way of, of playing. So it, a, a real, I would say like this, a real work of art always expresses, if it's a real work of art, the dream of a community. Notre Dame de Paris is the manifestation of, of, of a dream of that society. It, it tells us how that society dreamed to be. A community across time also, right? Not just, not just a community of, of 50 people today. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the problem because today music is somehow, or art in general, contemporary art in general, um, is maintained alive in a kind of artificial way because uh, there are, uh, uh, there is uh, very often a state uh, which gives money, subventions, but the state which is giving the money actually is not interested for real in what is produced. It's like to say, okay, we have, we have to do it, but, but who cares? Because, uh, and then indeed there are, as you said, uh, 20 persons. So, uh, and, 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 the, and the composition itself, the work of art itself uh, uh, does not come because does not arise because uh, 
people need it and the composer incarnates this this need uh, like it was uh, at Mozart time or Bach time or Schumann. Um, but uh, as you know much better than me, you, you can give uh, win a subvention if you submit a project, but of course in the project you cannot write I am more transcendental or I am better or I am <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, or metaphysical than other composers. So uh, you have to write something which can be measured. Uh, and usually what happens is that uh, since we cannot speak about truth, uh, then the parameter for given or not given a subvention is how original is it? But in a very stupid way, because uh, the question usually is, I am the first one as artist uh, who is doing this, who is painting using that specific technique, or I write a composition and I'm the first one who writes my uh, the scores uh, uh, like a tattoo on the body of someone, or I don't know. You, you can do a lot of things for the first time, but then that's not a reason to 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 think that it is artistic. You can do a lot of things for the first time, and these things are completely stupid or, or useless. Uh, so that should not be a parameter. Of course, you can do also things for the first time, but that's not the reason why you are a great composer or a great artist. Well, I'd like to respond to that. I, I gave a speech in London a few weeks ago at the ARC Forum. And uh, it was a very interesting occasion, actually. I got to exchange with quite a few different people from all different walks of life, politicians, business leaders, intellectuals, uh, hosts of podcasts, uh, public figures of all kinds. And there was a kind of generalized consciousness of the fact, because they, they obviously they knew I was an artist and I was there to be a sort of cultural ambassador, I suppose, and to represent creative types and, and artists at this conference. And everybody implicitly understood the value of art. There, were, there was nobody there, I think, who would have seriously questioned this. But there was a generalized sense amongst a lot of these people who are very close to the forces that are shaping our society of where are the artists? Where have they gone? What are they doing? We don't know what they're doing. We don't see their work. Uh, who are the great artistic figures of today? Uh, where are the Picassos, the Stravinsky's, the T.S. Eliot's, the, the Audens? Are they there? Is it just that there's a problem of communication? Is it that they're not doing anything? And this was a remark that I heard on many occasions from very powerful and influential people. People who were erudite, who were knowledgeable about the arts, who are interested in culture, who understand its value. But the question kept arising, where are you? What are you doing? Once again, where we are. That, that's the real question. And I think we should try, we should try to rethink all the system together because uh, um, those people were absolutely right because uh, the system right now most of the time is is sick and there is in my opinion there is no way if we maintain the same kind of si system for for subvention in art and proposing contemporary music there is no way that things will be better in the in the future actually the i'm quite sure things will collapse because at some point in the moment that uh, you have to decide, uh, okay, how I distribute this money. Uh, at some point, if you don't feel for real the necessity, the spiritual necessity of, uh, of, of art, at some point you will ask yourself, why I have to give so much money for this 20 idiots who want to a university to read Dante. Well, it comes back to what we were saying earlier about the, the problematic incentive structure we talked about, about uh, with exactly. politicians, for example. And I think this is actually a, an extremely serious problem. Yes. So if we look at the funding of the arts, historically it was the, it was the aristocracy, it was the nobility that, that, that paid for everything and that engaged artists. And after uh, well, the, late, the late 19th century, getting into the 20th century, then it, it particularly in the, in the Weimar period, mm -hmm. becomes a matter of private patronage. Uh, 
And then after that, after the Second World War, there was this idea, this somewhat utopian idea that the way for artists to maintain their independence and to be able to create without being subjected to the the extraneous forces and pressures of the marketplace is for them to become tenured professors in universities. And that the university could take on the role that the nobility had once filled. And this is, in fact, an attitude that was explicitly articulated by Milton Babbitt in one of his essays. And that has led us to a place that I don't think anybody would have wanted us to arrive at. Absolutely. And so one of the things that I'm concerned about is, in addition to the, well, the, all of these different uh, uh, funding models we've talked about, the, the aristocracy, private funding, universities, then we have the state-funded model, mm -hmm. which has been predominant in Western countries exactly. for 60, 70 years now where there's a certain amount of money that's set aside by the Ministry of Culture in whatever country, and then various committees and commissions decide who, who gets this funding. And it's attributed to individual artists. And that, in a sense, to me, seems to be by far the worst of all possible options. Um, now, if you talk to composers about this, you'll very often hear, but we, but we need this. We, we won't survive without it. Our, you know, our art form cannot survive on its own financing. So we need the state to help. But it creates, once again, this perverse incentive structure. Exactly. Where then the artists are chasing government grants and they're chasing the kind of influence that you need to have in order to get these grants in the first place. And this has become such a generalized and pervasive problem that I think it can actually pervert the entire artistic enterprise yeah. and also the relationship between artists and their audience. So, for instance, if you are receiving large amounts of public funding from the state in order to fund an ensemble, in order to fund commissions, and so on and so forth, then you are beholden to the temporary fleeting requirements of, what, of whatever those funding bodies are. It's, it's very difficult to be truly independent, I believe, in those sorts of circumstances. Um, and also, one of the effects of that is that if the funding is just magically there, uh, then, and, and you have some kind of a structure within which to operate, in a certain sense, and I've often had this sense at, at, at European festivals of new music, it doesn't matter who the composers are, they're interchangeable. Mm -hmm. It could be composer X, Y, or Z, who cares? You know, the audience will be there one way or another. And you don't actually have an audience, in fact. There is no organic audience for this music. There, there, there are people that go to these festivals, but they tend to be individuals who have a vested interest in being there. They tend to be other professionals, other composers. It's, it's more like a, a convention or a conference than an actual uh, a shared communal experience. And that seems to me, again, to be an extraordinarily dangerous place to be. So, okay, okay, so we've, we've, we've diagnosed the problem, but we're not going to spend all of our time talking about problems. So here's a hypothetical scenario. You, Luigi, are made the director of a new music ensemble. You are given a reasonable operating budget. We've talked about the problems. What do you do? I think that we have in the past great examples of, of a system which worked. It was not perfect, but, but it worked in, in, uh, in the sense that the society could feel the presence of great works of art and those works of art it was able to conceive them. Uh, if you just briefly think about the history of opera, for example, at the beginning, the opera was the necessity of the nobility and they, they wanted to be celebrated, of course, um, and the composer, so there was in this case a real need from them. And then the composers could speak about universal values, human values, uh, while answering these requests. Then later, it was not the, the nobility anymore, it was the aristocracy and then the bourgeoisie. Uh, but let's say the, the person who was uh, commissioning the works of art had always the sincere real need of them. So there is, the, and it, there was a group of people um, who really wanted these works of art. And in the moment that there is this community, even if it's not uh, super big, but this gives the possibility that from a real community, 
you can conceive a work of art which speaks to the entire humanity. If you don't start from a real living community which can uh, identify itself in that work of art, then no one will be interested in, in, in what we are doing. And so thinking about that, uh, the first thing would be to rethink from the beginning uh, the relationship between the composer and the commissioner. So, the, 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 so that there should be a, a dialogue, a real dialogue um, between the persons, so the mecenati, who, who, who want to support this, and the artists who have to be really together. So it's not only about uh, take them this money and write a symphony, like it is now with the state system, but it is who we are, which are our value, values, about what we want to speak, what, what would be our dream. Let's try to, or you are a composer, so we want to build such a community which could be like this, or an entire a community can be also the entire world. So let's start to name our va common values and uh, so that the work of art can, can have some strong roots, spiritual roots. And then once that uh, we have a new healthy relationship between the people who want to subvention and the composers, then you need also a humanistic approach for the, from the performer. So you, you, maybe you want to do less, but, uh, but, but, you, but we need to do it good. So it's not the, I don't believe that it makes sense to do 300 different programs every year. So like, like a factory, uh, but uh, once again, you have to communicate for real with your public. So you have to take the time uh, for the rehearsals so that the concert can be a real spiritual experience. Uh, Cerli Bidak uh, used to say, um, the, the better an orchestra it is, the, the more time I need. <laughs> Uh, no one could one could think uh, the, the opposite. You know, if you are, if they are better, it will be fine. No, because it precisely the better musicians who can go even far, uh, even no, even deeper. Uh, that's absolutely right. I've I've often had the experience of working with extraordinary musicians where you can always go a little bit farther, and the the sense of engagement is so deep that that there's no upper limit actually to how how good the performance can be. Conversely, with performers that are less engaged or are less involved, less interested, if they don't care fundamentally, then no amount of rehearsal is going to make the performance any better. Yes. We need to share not only, we, we, don't, we don't need to play well. We need to, sh to build a, a circle, a community between uh, mecenate, compositore, e interprete. So <laughs> I like to use the Italian words. Um, big and we need to rebuild a community together where each of us has the feeling that if he is not making his part in this system, he will die <laughs> because it is a necessity. You know? when, you are, when you want really to help the arts, when you really want to create a work of art or when you really want to perform a piece of music, it's not that you like to do it. It should be that if you don't do it, you die because doing this, it's like uh, oxygen. No, it's, uh, and I think uh, this kind of necessity, which should, should be triple, so for each of the three parts of the, of the process, uh, this circuit, this system should be first of all recreated, so to answer your question, and then proposed to the public. But I'm sure that in this case, the public will feel that the thing is real. And then, they will share with us more and more the necessity of this. And only while doing this, in my opinion, we can really be helpful for the society and, and show a possible horizon of values. 
what you're describing is not easy to do, right? Because this is not something that just already exists that you can just tap into. I think part of the problem is that there, there's a kind of pathway that exists currently that is extremely uh, insufficient, but it's there and it already kind of functions, right? So if, if you're a composer or if you're an ensemble, then you kind of know what the routine is. You can request a grant, you can write your piece, the piece will be played once, and then it will be forgotten. And mm -hmm. you can sort of accept that. And that, that's sort of the easy route, right? Because yes. the, all of those structures already exist. You don't have to invent them. But what you're describing is something that I think is necessary. I think it's necessary for the survival of, of this artistic culture. And artistic cultures are necessary for the survival of, of Western culture, by the way. Those two things cannot be dissociated from each other. But in order to do that, we are going to have to think differently. It's going to be difficult. There's not a pre-existing model. It will take convincing. It will take an enormous amount of work. But what's the alternative? There are no alternatives because people who are not able to take care of the present, they will also forget their past because they will not be able to understand. So they will have a vision of a kind of musification. We, yes, there, there have been uh, those things in the past. Yes, they are nice in the museum, but they, they, they are not alive anymore because they, uh, because also we need our own art in the present, but, which is not uh, something special for special people. It should be really for, for everybody. But this, the present system, which you have just described before, uh, which I call the artificial system, uh, that's for sure that leads to the catastrophe. And I'm really using the right word because, uh, uh, because uh, the, the poetic thinking is going to die. Uh, and uh, then there will be people who do not know anymore what art is, and that will be a desert. And this time is coming closer and closer, so the danger is real. And it's a pity that many of our colleagues do not see that this system, which might be convenient, convenient for them, and actually I speak also for myself because I'm also part of this system, uh, but, okay, it's convenient maybe today for the next 10 years, but then it, the game is over. And the catastrophe will be not f be egoistically for me or for you, but it will be for everybody. Because the society will be desertificated in, in, in terms of, of the, the, the spiritual sensitivity. And so I think uh, I, I want to try to to throw this message in a battle, if I can say like this, is someone there <laughs> can can say the, find a battle <laughs> and read the message. Um, I think it's really worth to try, and people who are willing to do that, uh, so to to rethink entirely the system. And I think once again, we it's not something completely new because there has been. There have been in the past many models, different and similar at the same time, which could inspire us. And those models were working perfectly. And uh, we have so many great works of art. Uh, one of the reasons of the difficult situation today that there are so, so little great works of art today is precisely in, in this system, because it's very difficult to conceive something which is, which is universal if you are in, in a fake uh, game. And uh, so once again, to rethink the, the basic relationship from the need of, of a work of art, so someone who is who, who, given the commission, the person who is actually doing and working on it, uh, feeling really the, the the connection with the real society, with the real community, and the performer who has to take in charge of the responsibility for all this, and taking the time for making a, a real, a sincere gesture, and not simply just playing notes, but taking the the moral responsibility of of and sharing this moral responsibility 
with with the public and only like this then a work of art a, a piece of music can can breath again and be alive again because it comes from a real necessity and it is played from people who really who really love because finally what we are losing is love and it is love in all the system which we need to to let arise again i think that's absolutely right and i think that's a that's a good note to end on before we stop we should point out that you have a book that's just been published so let's show what this looks like so this is a natural gesture and uh this is a book about the art of conducting much as the first half of this podcast has been about the art of conducting so where can we find this book we can find it uh, in the bookstores in internet uh, it has been published by volke verlag uh, so they have a website um so you can order it there or of course uh, everywhere on the net uh, on the usual places uh it has been published both in english and uh, in german so if you are also if you prefer to read it in german you can do it in german also too right okay fantastic and of course we also have this which i've mentioned a couple of times on this channel already but this is uh our new cd in glow of like seclusion and these are uh, works that were performed by Luigi and by Ensemble Proton Bern in Switzerland under ideal working conditions, I have to say. I'm, uh, and so this is uh, these are four recent chamber ensemble compositions of mine, and we'll put a link both to the publisher where you can uh, where you can get Luigi's book and also the the new CD. So Luigi, thank you very much for this stimulating discussion. What I take away from it is that there is work to be done. There is serious, real work to be done, but we're going to do it. Yes, we are going to do it. And I think our motivation is so strong that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. So in, even if this, the, the situation looks scary, I think uh, I'm still very optimistic uh, that we can somehow succeed it and make our parts as good as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much.